Welcome to Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson. This is uh, our last episode for the year. It's kind of cool. Um, Want to get a little bit of business done here. A um, couple of things going on. First, uh, I've published uh, a short story and a novella in the last month. Uh, it's kind of crazy, but it's stuff I've had and I've worked on and all the rest. So... I'd love you to uh, go ahead and pick those up because I'm kind of sponsoring myself here. Um, the novella is called The Casket Salesman. And uh, in 1964, when I was 12 years old, uh, my little character Sam was 12. And he got to travel around with his grandfather, um, Pop, who was a casket salesman. And he sold caskets to funeral homes and, of course... Um, 12-year-olds uh, who were in love with Frankenstein and Dracula and all the rest of that kind of stuff. My goal, Sam's goal, is to see a dead person and find out the truth about zombies. But instead, he learns about the keys of life. And um, Pop, on for his part, has a part, for his part, has a urgent need to tell his stories. Um, I know as I've gotten older that um, I want to uh, impart my experiences to the next generation, to the children of, of the things that I've gone through and I've learned. And hopefully that um, those stories build, um, they build the history and it also sort of ensures, in this case, that Pop won't be forgotten. Um, not that he would be because I've written a book about him, and uh, he had an extraordinary life. Um, he wasn't always truthful, but he was enter entertaining. And, you know, all families are not perfect. We all know that. Um, but there's a lot of portraying families as perfect, um, as an ideal. Um, it, it doesn't happen that way. So I think uh, these stories are about uh, my own personal immortality and the immortality of our experiences being passed along, and they contribute to the, the threads, the threads, actually, to the fabric that we call history and humanity. And that's the Casket Salesman available on um, Amazon Books, uh, also on Kindle. Uh, if you have Kindle uh, Unlimited, um, you can borrow the book. It's free. Um, the second is a short story called The Mosaic Artist, uh, which... Is about Carlos, who was eight. I, it's weird how I did these two coming-of-age stories. Um, starts during the Spanish Civil War. It's based on a true story. Um, a lot of things happened in the Spanish Civil War. If you're a Hemingway fan or you read anything by Hemingway, you have a taste of what it was like. Um, anyway, Carlos uh, uh, escapes as uh, from Sevilla. And uh, his grandmother and a, uh, and a flamingo dancer, Gypsy, uh, Thelia, uh, they make their, their way to France. Um, it's a story about uh, love and kindred spirit and um, creativity. And um, it's just, I think, really a beautiful story. It ends in tragedy, um, and, uh, but it's, it's fascinating, I think, um, and it's based on a true story. So that's the pitch for the for the the books today. Um, being the end of the year, I, I really want to thank uh, Paulette McWilliams for, you know, doing the opening of the show. Um, she has a new album um, that came out this year that's that's done really well. Uh, a woman's story. Um, you could listen to it on YouTube or uh, download it um, if you'd like buy it, um, iTunes, it's on Spotify, she's, she's really done some amazing, amazing work there, um, she's working on a new album, and uh, this year promises to be really, really exciting. I want to thank uh, Todd Bartu, who's helped me uh, produce the show, um, hasn't been around lately, um, he's off getting his MBA, um, for what reason I have no idea. Um, I also want to thank David Rigsby, whose new book, uh, Maga Sonnets, has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. It's a pretty big deal. 
Um, I did a whole series of short videos on the sonnets um, in which I did the narration and put them all together and produced them. I'll put the link in the in the notes. And I want to thank David for that. And also I want to talk, uh, thank Tommy Twang for all the music he's provided and the advice and just simply being a, a really good friend. Um, also, what we expect next year is a couple of really exciting things for the show. Um, as many of you who have followed me uh, from the beginning or came in between and uh, this is the 78th uh, show, uh, which seems like an awful lot to me. Um, but uh, if you if you kind of been getting and reading between the lines, you know that um, besides my sailing experience uh, and all the adventures I have, which I um, give to you, uh, I do a lot of writing, uh, and I do some producing uh, of television, and, and I've got a number of films. And I should say The Casket Salesman has been optioned to become a film, and we're waiting to see what actors we get uh, attached to it. So that's pretty exciting news, and that'll be for next year. I have a short story, which many of you loved as a podcast, um, The Importance of Place, um, it's going to be published in a prestigious online literary magazine called Live Encounters, a very cool magazine, uh, great writing, uh, politics, poetry, uh, short stories, um, just writing a philosophy and all sorts of things. It's, it's, it's a little left of center, um, but it is really a brilliant and honest uh, publication, and I'm very, very proud to be a part of it. Um, and I thank Mark uh, Ulysses, who's also a listener, uh, for publishing the story. And I think it's always cool when you can publish a story that, that has anchoring tips in semi-grease in it. And, and, you know, where to pay your harbor fees and, and you know, general all-around sailing advice for the sailor. That's always a great short story for me, you know, being informed and, and, and being entertained at the same time. I'll put the link in the notes uh, for the magazine. Um, it will be, my short story should be published in January, probably the first part of January. And I have a full... Um, book of stories coming out called A Sailor's Point of View, which many of you will know that I've taken a lot of the really good stories, the long ones, the real serious adventure stories, and I've written them, and um, they're being published um, by a publisher in San Francisco, and um, we were very excited about getting this book out, and it should be out um, sometime in the spring. Um, and I'm super excited about that. I'm also doing a nonfiction book called American Mariner, and I have talked a number of, I've done a number of episodes um, based on the subject matter. Um, I did the Robert Smalls episode, which is a part of that, and I've done, um, I also did the uh, Saki Divers, um, which is another wonderful story. Um, and I'm, I, these stories will all be in, um, one big kind of nonfiction, um, book. Um, and that should be published sometime next fall. Um, these things take time. I hope I'm alive by then. So there's a lot to do. Um, there's a lot happening and, uh, not to mention, of course, there's all the sailing and all the, uh, traveling. But I want to get started on the, the stories, um, you know, the tag, uh, sex and sailing redux. Um, I just want to say, first off, this, if you're riding around in the car with your kids listening to this podcast, it's probably not going to be suitable for kids, and it may not be suitable for prudes either. Um, I've had, I've, I'm doing this because it's been requested by more than one woman who have been listening and following, and they have come in and suggested that I revisit this subject because it's a kind of, it's a thing, okay? Because sex on the boat, life on the sea, and companionship 24-7, along with shared adventures, okay, all together, is the absolutely sexiest thing 
you will ever have the privilege of experiencing. What happens to you is real is a real experience, and 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 only when you go through this experience will you truly understand what it does to you. So let me couch um, my stories and get your brain and you know, no matter what's going on, whether you're driving in the car or operating heavy machinery or you're sitting on, in your cockpit of your sailboat or you're at the office, um, you know, whatever, whenever you listen to this podcast, you know, let's, let, I want to take you from wherever you are and put you into this atmosphere so that these stories don't seem um, self-indulgent or braggadocious, or whatever the case may be, because I'm telling stories that I've told um, on the in the cockpit in the evening um, after drinks, and there's a good reason for it. So let's pretend that you came over to my boat one evening, and we're sharing dinner. Maybe we have a drink or two. The sun is set, and the stars just blanket the sky. And the temperature is, say, a balmy 80 degrees or 27 degrees Celsius. And there's a cockpit light that hangs over the table. It's, it's made of, uh, it's an old uh, palm, uh, palm hat that I just put a little 12-volt uh, light in it and hung it from the, um, from, the, um, from the stay. And it just sits over the table and it gives a nice warm glow and the and the table itself is really highly varnished and and there's this sort of beautiful brown amber hue that everybody has taken um you know maybe you've been out in the sun all day you've been sailing all day and your skin is a little sensitive from you know all the wind and 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 the sun the salt and everything is sort of coming together and you're beginning to to seriously uh, relax. So the table has some remnants of a really fine dinner. Um, There's wine glasses with a couple of sips left in the bottom of the glass. And we might be into cognac at this point. And uh, I have my Tiffany cut glass snifters that are kind of coddling the uh, VSOP. And it has the smell, of the aroma of like fruits and flowers and oak notes and a kind of dreamy, rich, round, earthly flavor. Even without this aroma, you're, you're living and breathing all these flavors wafting across the water from the land. In the Caribbean, if we're in an anchorage in the Caribbean, the soft scent of palm maybe a hint of lilac floats across the water. If we're in the Pacific, the scents are sort of mixed. Um, It's, there's a lot of them. Uh, The flavor is sort of a stream of sweet smoke and, and sweet flowers and bougainvillea and all sorts of interchangeable, often you know, wafting in and out, mixed, and, and all the rest, and you're completely, you know, unaware that, that the flavors are constantly changing, and you're constantly smelling them, and it's constantly being a part of who you are at that point. If we were in Greece, there's always that beautiful, that beautiful earthy smell of rosemary and sage, um, dried coriander. Um, there's a the sense of, it's like if you smell like, You know, when the first raindrops on a hot, sunny day hit a rock and there's that smell that comes out of that that rock, that burnt, hard, sun-baked rock, and the water comes on and gives a kind of odor, that's that's grease. That's how grease feels with a mix of all the rest of that. And then, of course, we're in Turkey, and we all know that that is pine, heavy, thick pine, and the rich loamy smell of soil and that soil is like I always think of that soil I appreciate it so much it's like history it's like this is the smell of history and that's sort of what 
we're at. That's where we are. So right now you're in the cockpit. You're comfortable. The light is beautiful. Uh, a couple of fish may be jumping off the side of the boat. Um, but there's one, one thing that's nagging you. And you're asking yourself, why do I feel so hungry for sex? So you ask me, your captain, because there's nothing he can't deliver or know. So I tell you a story, several stories. This is Sex and Sailing Redux. Chasing the perfect woman. I chased the perfect woman around the Caribbean when in reality what I was doing as I was chasing my illusions, um, I was chasing society's illusions and delusions. And that is, that's not to say that I wasn't fully granted access to this sort of dream scenario of meeting a woman, falling in love, and having the most marvelous sex I've ever had in my life um, in the most marvelous place with all these smells and and vibrations and goodness and everything happening all at the same time. And, and she's totally into it as well. Matter of fact, many of the women that have suggested that I redo this thing have, suge- have often said, this is, that was the best time of my life, that kind of experience. It's, it's, it's innately fulfilling in a way. So one of the things, and I'll, I'll do this, is when I first got down to the Caribbean, I was single. I was, you know, looking for, you know, some action and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I'm, you know, I'm not ugly. Um, and I was, you know, looking to have some fun, which is going to party. And, you know, there's the shows now, Below Deck, et cetera, et cetera. And people are always talking, this is a kind of a party that's always going on with boats. And it's like, it's a culture of the right age of people in a way. It's not a culture of young people in their early 20s. It's more late 20s, even in that culture, you're kind of young, but it's more 30s, 40s, right in that area, you know, where people, you know, had experience, they're grown up, they know what they're doing, they know what they want, or they think they know what they want. In my case, I think I, I knew what I wanted. And that's why I was so busy looking for that one magical relationship and I was really that was the one thing on my mind of course there's sailing and there's the love of the boat and all the rest of the things that come with it but that was the one thing that was sort of really on my mind was trying to get in that kind of personal involvement but one of the things that I learned which is actually kind of cool and it's very different in the sense that um, different societies and different cultures, uh, when people come to this, come to the Caribbean or even Turkey or Greece or whatever the case may be, and they get on the boat, there's a sense of letting loose. There's a sense of freedom, and every culture um, that these people that people come from has a kind of a different way of doing it, and it's a very it's very unique um, to the culture, and it's very specific. And I, I, I really kind of thought it was sort of, you know, kind of amazing. So in terms of nationalities, um, I have had um, Americans, obviously, on my boat. I've had South Africans, um, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, French, English, German, Italian, Greek, Turkish. I'm trying to think if there's any others. That's about it. That was about it. Okay, so in each one of those, there's a different kind of way people kind of approach the boat. And even in America, different Americans from different parts of the country come in and they're just like, like wild. Like one of the first groups that I of Americans that I ever had on my boat was a they were from Montana one was a crop duster and the other guy was uh, he worked uh, on the oil drilling rigs in Alaska and um, their wives you know this one of the wives just got new boobs right 
So she's sitting in the cockpit next to me. Her husband's right across from me. I'm steering, you know, I'm at the helm. I'm steering the boat. We're talking. She's like, oh, yeah, I got these. And he's talking about how much they cost and how much he likes them. And she takes her shirt off and she says, here, you want to feel they feel real. And I'm like, oh, don't think so. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that was just like the first step in there. Uh, ability to sort of uh, be uninhibited at that point. So that started. So she's sitting there with her brand new um, purchased boobs in the cockpit. Don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a lot of boobs in my cockpit. And, and her husband's sitting there, and he's like very, very proud of this. And then we get into this conversation, you know, they, you know, what kind of charters do you do? And I've always done you know, it, gay charters, nude charter, any, any kind of charter. I don't care. Um, doesn't bother me one bit. Um, you know, I don't look, I don't have to look, I don't have to care. I just, you know, do the charter the way the charter is. And so I had this, so the, the couples, the two couples are sort of slowly kind of changing as they go They're you know, Montana Republicans, I should say. And now they're starting to get the vibe. You know, she's like the sexy thing. And and the other woman is, you know, kind not really sexy, but sexy. You know, she's nice. They're in their 30, late 30s. Um, and her husband and her go up on the foredeck as we're sailing, um, like maybe the second, third day. And, um, you know, she takes off her top and... And he's in there in their bathing suit, and the two of them are laying there in the boat. It's just gently, you know, we we've got a nice, you know, beam reach on, and the sun is like, you know, right, right, you know, we're we're, we're heading south, and so the sun's right on them, and so she's getting undressed slowly. He gets undressed. Next thing you know, the two of them are naked up on the deck, and they're sailing. We're sailing along, sailing along, and the girl with the boobs is sitting there, and the guy who is the uh, crop duster pilot he's he's sitting there taking it all in he was pretty cool and you know it's just like yeah this is fun yeah we're having a great time and you know having a drink and all the rest of this kind of stuff and then he turns to me and he says uh he says you want to fuck my wife and i go like no <laughs> not particularly because i had my girlfriend is downstairs right she's preparing lunch and it, just this stuff, he would have never said that kind of thing to me or to anyone ever, okay? But what the thing was that I didn't know about these two couples is, even though they were both from Montana, they were both swingers, and they had met each other at a swingers convention in Houston, Texas. And they make this vacation once a year where they get together. And so what we found out is they were swapping, they, you know, they're, they were in the aft cabin, the whole week worth of charter was just nothing but sex. And I actually, I had to talk to um, Florence, who is my uh, maid at the time, and who was just as gorgeous as, as you could possibly imagine, and a great chef, and and you know, really nice and and very polite and and not so innocent. She was French and she you know, she was she would sun nude all the time on the boat and didn't care. In fact, she was selling um, uh, beignets on the on the beach in Saint Martin when I first met her, and um, she was selling them on the naked beach. Um, so she doesn't have a she didn't have a problem with any of this, but it got to be such a problem. Both these guys are walking around with giant boners all the time. And, you know, we're just sort of like furniture. And I thought to myself while all this was going on, like, this is so, you know, the hypocritical American kind of thing. They're super Republican, super conservative at home. But boy, you get them out and they go crazy. And that's kind of my American feel to it. Um, my French friends that have been on the boat with me, um, much more relaxed. Um, sex happens when sex happens. Um, you know, nakedness is very well accepted. It's uh, very much, you know, a kind of uh, 
I, I, I imagine it is, it's sort of a Bridget Bordeaux, Sophia Loren, even though she was Italian, kind of, you know, there's some sort of sexy femininity about the whole thing. And the boat brings this out, both the women and the sexiness in the men. They kind of lose this, um, the Frenchmen that I know, and I know an awful lot. I lived there for close to 20 years. There's a kind of, you know, uh, edge, uh, a cynicism to a certain degree, but really, it, basically, Frenchmen are, are diehard romantics. And they're always looking and searching, just as I would look, I was looking and searching for, you know, that woman, that, that, that right experience, and I shouldn't say just a woman in terms of like a misogynistic kind of point of view, but I'm saying just the experience of a couple. That's really what I'm looking for. So the French are very sort of laissez-faire about the sex, and it was all, you know, wonderful and 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 semi-public and nude and not caring and caring and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Kind of inter very interesting, very comfortable, and the boat experience brought this out even more because on land they would be very like you know normal people conservative etc um in terms of showing their bodies or or you know talking about sex um they didn't like to talk about sex a lot um it wasn't a big deal i had a number of uh germans and um that's like they come out and it's almost like a porn movie um, <laughs> come on. yeah, it's like, uh, I want sex now, you know, kind of, uh, it's just, it's insane. That's just, there's this, I don't know where the romanticism is in, in their hearts, but when they get on the boat, it's, it's like a porn film and they act like porn people. And it's really to, to, a, it, to my eyes, it was completely comical. Um, very, very comical. Um, and, and it was just, it was just amazing. Um, I had some, uh, a group of Greeks on the boat, um, uh, you know, uh, couples, um, they, they turn out to be quite, uh, uh, private and, and conservative, um, to say the least, the, the motion of the boat, it's just like their old hats at being in the, on the boat and, and doing that. Um, the Turks, uh, I had a number of couples in the Turks. There is a real tension between the conservatism of their society and their desires um, as human beings. And when you get them out on a boat and start sailing, there is, there's just like electric um, stuff going on. Although they remain public, they're not public about their, their, desires to have sex and to have sex on the boat. But the boat unlocks this um, tension that is in the society itself, being a conservative Muslim society, um, you know, restricted to women. And women, the Turkish women, they get out on a boat, and the Turkish men get out on a boat. And they just, there's, there's none of that conservatism, and they just sort of kind of get wild and crazy about the whole thing. Um and I, I know this from the fact that um, uh, we had I had a um, a belly dancer um, who was a very famous belly dancer in Marmaris, and um, she's a very beautiful woman. And I would say she was also extremely smart. And she kind of she knew the ropes, she knew the game. Um, you know, a lot of uh, Middle Eastern men are are pretty hypocritical when it comes to you know uh, sex and. There's their wives and their family and lots of restrictions. And then, you know, there's any kind of woman I can get a hold of to have sex with that's okay by me. Um, I know a very famous uh, producer here in Los Angeles that is, um, he's, he's very much that, that way. There's a, there's a general sort of line of hypocrisy. Um, and this belly dancer, and she was... Um, she was very, very, very bright in the sense that she was able to exploit that hypocrisy, and especially on boats. Um, she would do a special thing in the summer where she'd come out and dance on big mega yachts. That's how I first met her. 
and she would do a whole show and she was you know a lot of fun and it, you know she got the men to get up and belly dance i i was a part of it at one time um and there was a full expectation that she would she was being hired to have sex with these guys and they um she never did she she was very deft at moving back and forth between that wanting to have sex and not having sex and i think it just drove people crazy um but that's that's what belly dancing is about it's just there's a sort of tradition that exists with that um and it's ironic um and very interesting to say the least so there's a couple of that's you know that's just sort of a, my general point of view i mean of course it's you know you can it, generalizations are never very safe um and always can be punctured with some sort of um antidote or whatever the case may be and but there is a thing that when people come on the boat they just they just let loose um one of the things there's several things that people do on a boat um which uh to me are 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 pretty ironic and kind of funny and one of the experiences i had and i am susceptible to all of this I'm truly susceptible to all of this was if you remember the movie uh, from here to eternity where you know they're making love on the beach and the surf comes up and it's just like the most romantic um love affair going on in the film and it's iconic image of them making love on the on the sand in the in the in the surf and um rolling around everything is just really beautiful <laughs> let me tell you there's just no way you can do that comfortably this sand from in the water gets everywhere and ladies you know what i'm talking about and guys you probably get the idea and there's just no way to concentrate when the surf keeps breaking over you. Um, it seems really wonderful and romantic, but in all practicality, it's a stupid thing to do. Even making love on the beach is kind of a stupid thing to do, to be honest. I mean, if that's the only place you're gonna gonna be able to do it, and and quite honestly, I've done it a dozen times that way, and I've seen I've had guests do it that way. Uh, you know, get down behind the bushes and, and make love and come out. And, you know, it's like, it's like they were rolling around in a, in a tub of sandpaper and, and they're just red and, and blistered and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Another thing a lot of people like to do is, is they, they, they like to um, be like exhibitionists. And I'm going to tell the, this quick story. I had a very, very famous um, uh, group of guys um, from, um, I don't want to say their names because it's kind of private, but um, let's say that they're from a, a major uh, clothing store in the world. They're Italian. Um, they also sponsored Formula One cars. That's enough hint for that. And the sons of the guys who started this very famous uh, clothing line, they were um, out on the boat with me. They, we were doing a charter for a week. Um, we were going to hang around in St. Martin. Uh, we were going to do a couple of other things. And we had this very weird thing happen. And I'm, I'm telling this story because it may appear in the beginning that I'm talking about how men are aggressive in terms of wanting to get companionship and sex and couples and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But women are equally aggressive um, on this. So they had this girl come who shows up, and she is um, very pretty, a model, and a photographer. I think she was a, somehow a photographer. And she was the only girl besides my girlfriend at the time that was on the boat. And she... She was hell bent on getting uh, one of the the sons. I think his name was Carlos, to be like she. That's all she wanted was like him. She 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 had uh, designs on his butt like you couldn't believe. But these guys 
all they wanted to do was sit on the back of the boat, go sailing, drink, and play cards. That was their thing. Uh, they didn't really want to do anything else. She came and kind of made them do other things, like take her out, like go disco dancing, um, and do all the rest of this stuff. And she was very aggressive in this in this way. Um, eventually, uh, they put her off the boat. They they actually literally got her on an airplane and flew her back to France um, because they just they just couldn't do it. And 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 you know we would be sitting in the cockpit and she would be sitting in there and standing in front of the helm. And this is some of the things that the captain has to go through. And she'd be da- dancing topless in front of me, like you know, like a, a foot in front of me. And I'm trying to sail the boat. And that the guys were th- thought it was all very entertaining and very funny. And there's another sort of aggressive sort of way. And I tell the story about. Uh, how I nearly got fired um, by this girl called Texas. And one of the first jobs I have had on a charter boat, um, we were coming out of a bar late at night with the guests and everything, and Texas um, was a, a, a stewardess, and she was a, a cook. And uh, she had a lot of, um, you know, uh, skills, and she was on a boat. And in this case, she was not on the boat, and and she had asked uh, to get a ride in the dinghy out to a boat that was an anchor that was sort of serving as a sort of temporary uh, apartment for her. And um, that's I took her out there. I put the guests on the boat. There, I was actually the mate, at the, and uh, the captain mate, the captain um, Ruth uh, knew Texas, and um, she knew her quite well. Uh, they had sailed together a couple of times. And long story how she was the captain. Um, so anyway, we put the uh, the kids back, uh, the guests and kids, into the boat. And Ruth was with them. And I took the dinghy and I took Texas out to this rented um, um, boat out uh, um, in the middle of the bay. And... Uh, you know, then one thing led to another, and there was massaging, and there was um, a couple of other things going on. And then the next thing you know, I was waking up uh, in her bed at uh, like four o'clock in the morning, and I got back in the dinghy going, oh man, got back in the dinghy and idled slowly up to the back of the boat with the guests in it, and climbed on board and went down, and I didn't even I didn't go to my bed I just laid down on the couch on the sofa until it was time to get up and Ruth got up at like five so and she was literally waiting for me and she almost fired me right there I mean she was going to fire me and then she she just she didn't and you know it was a lesson I learned about and she was very adamant about telling me you know you don't have sex when we're on a charter you know it's all about the charter itself you know, you don't screw the guests and you don't go off the charter and have guests, you know, with other mates or whatever, girlfriends or whatever the case may be. Charter is charter, full attention on the charter, no sex, period, anywhere off. And I pretty much followed that rule. And I say pretty much because there was a couple of instances in which uh, I didn't do it. Um, but that was because I was my own man at the particular time. And one of those uh, uh, stories is um, I got a day charter, um, more than a day charter, a couple of day charter um, out of um, uh, 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 Monte Carlo. And uh, Monaco, um, for those uh, to be specific. And it was a, it was a woman that, that I was writing actually a libretto uh, for an Italian composer or com- uh, um, uh, conductor, I'm sorry, it was an Italian conductor, um, for the uh, uh, Monaco Opera. And it was a commission job, and I was just, it was just a story that I'm putting together, a librato. And then the music stuff would come later. And I don't, I'm not a music guy, but I'm a good story guy. So uh, the woman that introduced me to this was an English woman, very nice, very kind, um, lived in Antibes, been 
been on the boats for years, had done a lot of stuff, very cool. And she suggested that I um, go meet this woman who lived in this fabulous old style uh, apartment in Villafranche, which is right outside of Monaco. And she was on the board of the Monaco Opera. And when I first met her, she was by her pool. Um, she was early 50s. Um, a very interesting, very interesting woman. She was uh, um, naked when she we took the meeting. And uh, naked in the sense that she had a very sheer uh, top and um, bottom on, uh, which was so sheer that it was, I don't even know why they made it. Uh, it was basically being, I was, I was like crazy. And then she invited me to go swimming and, you know, I didn't bring any swimming trunks. It didn't matter to her. Um, and I was just trying to get the job. Right. And so I said, okay, you know, and I went swimming, no trunks. She got in with me. One thing led to another thing. Then she's going to come on my boat and do a charter, and we're going to talk about the opera and all the rest. We spent two days not talking about opera. I'll just leave it at that. But there's a sort of thing. I mean, she often, she told me that during this, is just wish she could capture this feeling of what it's like to get on a boat, on this sailboat, and sail, and that 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 sense of life and exhilaration. And, and how much it, it informed her sexuality and all these other sorts of things. And, and it, was, it was this whole sort of quasi-intellectual um, bashing of thighs sort of thing. And it was, it, was very, it was very entertaining and very exciting. And I did actually get the job, and I was, I was, uh, I was very happy for that. Um, it absolutely didn't go anywhere. Another story, and I'm telling these little vignettes just to give you a sort of overview, because one, one of these little stories could be an entire um, book, to be honest. In my quest to look for the perfect woman, I ran into this Brazilian woman who had come to charter the boat. Um, and she had this, uh, strangely enough, she had this entourage um, and one of the entourage people um, was an American, and she long gray hair, and um, she was a new age, and she she did this whole thing with crystals, and and meditation, and new age techniques um, for this and for that. I had no idea what they were doing, but they had requested. I was on a um, a yacht at the time. They had requested that the upper deck that they would have that for themselves so they could go up there and chant and meditate and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And, of course, they would they would all sit up there nude and everything. And the woman who was paying for it was this Brazilian woman. She was the same age as I was. Um, just, just absolutely wonderful, if not a tiny bit flaky. And she was just looking for something to... Um, to grasp on to. She had just divorced a very rich man. Um, she had a son by him, and the son um, was now living with him. His son was like in his 20s. So she had been with this man for 20-some years, and she started with him, married him when she was like 18. Um, still a very beautiful woman, very vivacious um, they had special dietary needs, and the whole food thing sort of changed. They ate soups. I remember uh, my mate and I, I must have made something like 18 different types of soups um, so that we could keep a variety of things going in. And food became kind of an important thing, and it also became a problem. In the Eastern Med, you pay for each meal. It's not like a carte blanche kind of thing, like it is in the Caribbean, where meals are included. You know, you pay a little extra for some booze, etc. But for the most part, everything is included. And, and in the Eastern Med, it's there's a price for each meal. You know, 
35 dollars for for dinner breakfast is a certain breakfast and lunch are together you know there's a whole pricing schedule and it's like eating in a restaurant type of thing and that's why i paid a chef to be on the boat because we were providing you know five star food um and to this and 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 these these women this woman in particular the brazilian girl she kind of missed the whole point of doing that they spent a lot of time you know doing this chanting and doing and i would move the boat and the and and the brazilian woman and this um guru of crystal world um they would come and sit in the cockpit with me as i drove the boat we were moving we were in greece and we're going from island to island to island we're moving around um, you know, during the day, we'd get there, we'd find an anchorage, we'd sit in the anchorage, we were in Turkey. Um, this charter ran for like two weeks. It was a big charter. It was a lot of money involved with it. But the one thing that they had not calculated was the fact that at the end of the day, there was a bill for them to eat for their food. And this Brazilian woman was completely baffled by this whole concept. She couldn't understand it. And it ended up being a big problem. I didn't want to make a big, big problem or big to do about it. I just wanted to get back some of the costs that we had. We eventually ended up going to the broker who signed everybody up and going to the ex-husband and the ex-husband ended up paying all the bills. And they get off the boat. Now we're, we're in Rhodes, Greece, and they're all going to fly home. We've just spent two weeks with them and she was very nice and she was, you know, just like very reserved, very closed off. There was no flirting. There was no nothing. And she left the boat with all these, with her entourage of people. And my chef, who I'd hired just for the trip, had left. Um, the mate that I had on the boat, um, she had left. This was um, a 72-foot um, uh, San Lorenzo. And, um, and the mate had gone. She had she had gone off to, to the cleaners to take um, the laundry and all the rest is what we do right after the charter. And like half hour later, the Brazilian woman is standing at the back of the boat asking to come on board. And I was just completely dumbfounded. And she came on and asked if there was anybody around and if she could talk and is it possible to do this. Now, granted, she had just basically paid something in, a, in the neighborhood of about $25,000 for a two weeks charter with these. And then she paid the crystal people and her entourage and the plane tickets. She was into this whole thing for probably close to 75 grand. She came back to the boat and she asked, if it was possible that she could stay on the boat for another two weeks because she was afraid to go home. Yeah, she was afraid of her ex-husband and she just, she wanted to hide out on the boat. And of course, I didn't let her do that. I mean, it's not that I was being cruel or anything, but I had another charter. I mean, I was getting ready. We were going to work hard, be leaving in the next two days. So we couldn't do that. But this is a thing in which she, she, this is what she shared with me, that all the stuff of her sitting up on the upper deck, naked, chanting, and all the rest of the stuff, she says to me, the only thing I could think about through all of that was having sex. And she asked me, why is that? Why? She says, I don't think that way often. She says, you know, I've been going through a lot of stuff. But I'm the boat. It's just always sex. That's all I could think about. And I laughed and I said, well, that's what the boat does to you. That's what being on the sea does to you. If you, if you, you can get used to it, but it's always present. It's in the back of your mind. It's in your, it sort of settles in your loins. And she was like, oh, she says, I thought it was you. I was like, well, I wish that was so. And at that moment, I was just, oh, it was everything, every strength that I could get to uh, resist this woman's charm. But there was a certain aggressiveness to it, which is, I'm 
kind of putting it down for that. So that was that story. Um, she de eventually left. I never heard from her again. Um, very interesting, the sense of present tense. And uh, there's so many stories that I could tell about sex. Um, especially uh, there was a Spanish lady that was on the boat with me, um, private charter, uh, just captain only, private charter, um, for one week, um, and, and she literally had to go get on an airplane at the end of it. It was just the crazy thing, which I broke all the rules, by the way. Um, and she was just, she was just there to have sex equals life, life equals sex. And that's just what she wanted. And she had seen my picture and decided that's where she wanted to go. And I felt a little, you know, cheap, kind of a gigolo-ish kind of thing. Um, but you know, it was, it wasn't really, really the sense of what, what the whole thing was. I mean, it may have looked that way from the outside, but the inside, it was just sort of interesting and romantic and, and very tactile and very much, uh, fun and, and, and just a different kind of level. And it was, it was that sense that you get in a boat and you start to feel really comfortable about your own sexuality and, and the, the sexuality of, of the, the people you're with and everybody is, is sort of in this little kind of wonderful little bubble that's happening to you and you're just really digging it and, and it's just, you know, outside uh, judgments, you just, they don't, they don't add up. Once you're inside, you're experiencing it, the boat is moving, you're getting all the vibes going in the right direction. The waves, the winds, the smells, the temperature, the, the air on your skin, everything, and it all becomes uh, its own thing. But just to sum up, there's a couple of small stories that uh, I'll tell later. There was um, a, a executive of a very large um, entertainment company that brought her carpenter um, to the boat for a, for a charter. Um, I did a lot of gay men um, charters, absolutely great, um, always wonderful. Um, I did uh, a group of lesbians, gay women. Um, I did. Actually, they were very, uh, they always came back. Um, I did a lot of repeats. Um, as I said before, I've done the couples swapping back and forth. Um, uh, I've had, you know, German, I had a, a German guy come on the boat with uh, three girls. They were all porn stars. That was their, their big thing. And um, one, one kind of small thing is, is that Sometimes in the boat, in the boat world, in the yachting world, um, there's a lot of people that want to get on the boat. And they want to get on the boat for a variety of reasons. They want to escape their life. They want to get out of the country. They want to go do something else. And I was in Russia. I was actually in Crimea. And um, there was a line of girls standing outside the boat asking if, if I wanted to marry them because they were so desperate to get out of Russia. This was before Russia left and left it to Crimea, left Crimea to um, Ukraine's, the Ukraina. And, and so it was a mix of Russian and Ukrainian that they wanted to get out because there was so much turmoil at the time. And of course, you know, I'm not going to just, you know, start loading the boat up with girls and go off. I'm not that kind of, you know, person. And um, it was a very interesting experience how that how the boat draws um, all sorts of people, both men and women, um, into this really special vibe that's going on. Thank you uh, for listening. Uh, this is uh, our last uh, podcast for the year. I'm glad to see this year go by, to be honest. Let's hope next year is a great year for all of us. I hope you enjoyed it. I tried not to get too specific uh, as far as, you know, bad taste, etc. But um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will see you with another podcast on January the 5th. 
And this is uh, Scott Dodgson uh, over and out.